Welcome to Waxcombe Farm. The farm is 1,500 acres or 625 hectares in size. It's a mixed arable and beef farm. I felt that the payments we were receiving from uh, the European Union were unsustainable and that we weren't going to be getting them forever. And the system which we were in was not going to be financially viable. So I was looking to cut costs out of our system. And for me, one of, the, one of our biggest costs was the, the tillage prior to planting, planting a crop. And I came across a clip on YouTube of someone planting winter wheat into standing mustard. And the light bulb moment was that moment and realizing that there was another way, a, a way that I could reduce the hours spent in the tractor um, and improve our system. In uh, 2014, we, we bought a drill very similar to the drill that had been planting that wheat in that clip. So we're now able to plant seeds directly into the residues left behind from the previous crop. And that's where the sort of the journey began of, of understanding how the soil works and how full of life a healthy soil is and how devoid of life uh, an in intensively farmed soil can be. We used to grow wheat for two years, then barley, and then a break crop, uh, which would normally have been oilseed rape. When we made our change, one of the big things I wanted to add into our system was diversity. The biggest way of adding diversity we have is the cover crops. When we plant a cover crop, we're planting up to 12 species at a time all together. And this is putting life into the soil because all plants, when they photosynthesize, they exude um, sugars into the soil to feed the beneficial fungi and bacteria that live around the root zone. By growing the cover crop, we're planting things that aren't normally planted in our soils. So we're putting different sugars into the soil and feeding different microbes. And adding to this diversity, we're then building soil health, which will benefit the crops that we then grow after that cover crop. We then added in to our arable rotation, grazing the cattle. So rather than just keeping the cattle on the permanent pasture, when we were growing cover crops, we were able to move the livestock onto fields that had been just arable all the time. We were reintegrating the livestock into the arable system. We're also increasing the herd size of our cattle, which will enable us to have more grass in our arable rotation. And we're going to move the grass that we grow around the farm. So in a 15 year period, the whole farm will have been grass at some point. With our grazing system, um, we're, as, we're mimicking nature by moving them regularly and keeping them mobbed up. This has had a number of benefits. We now use no artificial fertilizers on our pasture. We still get a very similar grass growth to that which we had before when we were using fertilizers. The thing we've really noticed, because they move every day, we don't have to use wormers. We test their manure out in the field. We take samples and we have them sent off and analysed. 
and we don't have problems with stomach worms in the livestock anymore. And I'm sure it's because we're moving them every day. They don't come in contact with too much manure that is lying on the ground. In the summertime, we move animals daily and we don't come back to the same bit of pasture for about 60 days. So that gives a lovely long rest period for the grass to recover. It will, grasses go through their whole life cycle in that, in that short space of time. We then graze it and then leave it to go through its life cycle again and get through to a point where it's starting to put a seed head up before the cows come in and graze it. Because we don't use any wormers or any insecticides on the farm anymore, we're finding that the dung beetle is very evident following the cows around. Um, any one dung pat will have hundreds of little holes in it where the dung beetles are going in and out and they're breaking down that manure in the field and putting it into the soil where it's then utilized by the microbiology and the plants themselves. Our lovely friends behind us do produce methane. However, methane breaks down in the atmosphere in about 12 years. So if a herd of beef cattle remains the same size over 12 years, they're not actually putting any extra methane into the atmosphere. It is just cycling. Add into that, when the soil is healthy, there are bacteria that live in the soil called methanotropes, which break down methane as it hits the soil. So an animal dunging out on a healthy pasture much of that methane will be broken down in the field before it even gets into the atmosphere. That's very different from livestock that are housed and their manure stored, releasing methane to the atmosphere. With the no-till system, we're disturbing the soil less. So we're encouraging less weed seeds to germinate, which means we can reduce the amount of herbicide we use. But there is a point in the system where we do need a broad spectrum herbicide. At the moment for us in, in England and across the EU, the only real broad spectrum herbicide available to us is glyphosate. Now, I know there are many who see glyphosate as a problem and it is certainly detrimental to soil health but I feel it is less detrimental to soil health than heavy tillage would be. Since we've changed what we do we've reduced the fertilizer bill on our farm significantly we haven't used any artificial phosphates or potash on our farm for six years now. And with nitrogen fertilizer, we've significantly reduced the amount that we use. I believe that as we've increased the amount of legumes in the system and the cover crops and improved the soil health, there is more available nutrient for the plant and we don't need to put it on in the expensive bagged form that we always used to. As well as reducing herbicides and reducing fertilizers, we have completely cut out all insecticidal use. So there are no, no insecticides on seed dressings. We don't dress our seed anymore. Um, we always used to use seeds with a fungicide and often an insecticide on, coated onto the outside of the seed before we planted it. We cut that out three years ago 
and we've seen no detrimental effects to our yields as a result of that. In moving to the no-till on the arable side, one of our biggest savings has been diesel. We have cut diesel usage by just over 40% since we made the change. This is really down to not cultivating. With our combine harvester, we no longer take all the straw through the combine. Because we want to leave the straw in the field, we now use a different header on the front of the combine to just remove the ear of the corn and leave the straw standing. So this means that the combine's taking less material through it and therefore needs less power to run. We're holding on to our soil. We're not seeing soil moving out of the field. We're holding on and building the carbon in our soil. Keeping the soil covered over the winter has had a knock-on effect. The cover crops that we grow through the winter to protect the soil and to feed the soil are acting as a reservoir for wildlife. Where in the past we'd have had either bare soil or just empty stubbles through the winter, we now have a living cover crop, often sort of waist high, which is providing shelter and food for endless wildlife from brown hares to voles and moles and little field mice, all, all increasing. And on the back of that, we're seeing more kestrels, more barn owls, red kites, buzzards. In the summertime, we're seeing more butterflies, lots more songbirds in our hedgerows these days than we were seeing 10 years ago. In reducing the nitrogen fertilizers, we're reducing the carbon footprint of this farm significantly. The production of nitrogen fertilizers is very energy intensive. And on top of that, nitrogen fertilizer on the soil gives energy to the bacteria in the soil to burn off carbon. In using nitrogen fertilizers, we're not only burning fossil fuels to produce them, we're also burning carbon out of our soils. By not tilling the soil, we're not oxidizing the carbon that we have in our soil. We're holding it in the soil and that's also reducing the carbon footprint of our soil by increasing the sequestration of the carbon in the soil. My plans for the future are to continue adding diversity to our system. We'd like to follow the cows with some pasture-raised chickens, which will pick over the dung, taking out the maggots that might be growing in the, in the dung behind the cattle. We also have uh, plans to plant a lot more hedges and trees in amongst our fields. So we want to create some alleyways within the field where we can still farm the field in an arable or a grazing situation, but we'd have rows of trees to break it up and give shelter for the cattle when they're grazing, but also protection for the soil and more diversity in that soil. We also want to uh, open up some of our woodland and allow the livestock to move through that as well. Um, and um, one of the other things we might do is, uh, is move into having a few pigs to also go through the woodland. 
we want to look at getting closer to our, to our marketplace. So we're looking to work with local butchers so that we can sell our, our meat direct to butchers or possibly even direct to the consumer um, through a website. In 1940, on this acreage, we would probably have been employing in the region of 30 staff full-time. Today, we employ two full-time staff. That has come about due to mechanization and simplification of systems. We're trying to move back to a more complex system involving more diversity and that will probably lead to more employment on the land. Nature never simplifies, it's always complex. And if we want to work with nature, we have to work towards that complexity and add more diversity to our systems. For much of my farming time, yield has been king. And sometimes we've chased that yield at the expense of profitability. That is where I think farming needs to really concentrate hard on how we get that margin there, not how we just chase, chase the best yield.